This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. Welcome back to the conclusion of my conversation with Changemaker Ivory Matthews, the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer for the Columbia Housing Authority. Ivory, I want to circle back to something you mentioned at the beginning of part one. And first, I want to extend my condolences to the residents' families that were involved in that tragedy you mentioned. And I actually remember reading about it in the news and the immediate impact that made its way through housing authorities on how they deal with carbon monoxide. How did you seek to restore the community dynamics there once that terrible tragedy happened? Yeah, so unfortunately, when, you know, when the tragedy occurred, you know, housing authorities really, some housing authorities, um, you know, if you've never had to deal with communications, being able to have a good, clear communications plan when you have tragedy face you, it's, it's very difficult because especially with the speed of Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and all these things, stuff can happen very quick. And so the housing authority was not really prepared at that point to address how fast the communication was was coming in. And it wasn't positive communications. It was all negative communications. And so one of the things um, that I did, because I understand the importance of communications and being available and and also setting aside time to meet with your media uh, folk and, and standing up and listening to people. Like listening is a big, big, big thing. You, you have to listen and, and then respond. Um, and so one of the things that I did was I said immediately, Ivory, I am the new leader of the organization. I am going to listen to the people. I'm going to do the work and I'm going to take responsibility for moving this agency forward. And in and, and me saying that, I showed people and I continue to show people that we're doing the work. And I think that is what continues to build public trust. When you tell people that you're going to do something and you actually do the work. Well, nobody wants to go through a crisis moment. And Mm -hmm. whether you're the new leader, the leader that's been there for 20 years. um, But unfortunately, we work with people and properties and boilers and elevators and all of these things that we can control and then a whole group of things that we cannot control and working through that moment takes such finesse and like you said communication and working with all parties that are involved there so um, a good job to having to learn lessons the hard way I think would be the you know piece of this that is unfortunate but it doesn't ever go away in this industry either. Oh, no, it doesn't. And one of the things I, I want to say, too, one of the things I think that was tremendously helpful was I have always, you know, had a really good relationship with our elected officials who represents us in D.C. on both sides of the liberal and conservative, right? So I joined in, in July of 2019 and November of 2019, Senator Tim Scott invited me to testify for the approval for Congress to approve the carbon monoxide bill. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was a huge momentum shift because it was the first time that the housing authority really publicly said, we want to make sure that this incident does not happen to anybody ever again. Well, I appreciate you talking about this because it's sort of like the mental health, you know, conversations. It's people talk about, you know, not talking about it or Mm -hmm. people needing to talk about it, but nobody really knows how to navigate and demystify this. And as an industry, sometimes we say, oh, crisis management, disaster response, and we give them these non-personal names and Mm -hmm. it turns into a process, it turns into a department. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we lose sight of the actual person that is involved in making policy changes inadvertently or trying to make sure that our staff are accountable and our systems are up to snuff and working through that. And, you know, you're really, really driving that home. Even on a positive note, you know, I really enjoy 
reading what you're doing in your partnerships with education, you know, whether it's education, healthcare, employment, you know, you're really expanding that line of impact. Tell us about what you're doing with Allen University and the local trade college, because you have so much going on that you're feeding into your community. Go over some of those dynamics with us. The foundation of what we do is brick and mortar, right? We're property managers to the real estate managers to the core. But we also have people who who live in these units that we have to to do something beyond brick and mortar. And so I call these things our beyond brick and mortar types of activities. And our partnership with Allen University started out with Allen University is a historically black college and university that sits, it's actually in the heart of of our community where most of our residents live. And a lot of our residents have graduated from Allen University and have gone on to do great things and so forth and so on. And so Allen University, their athletics department is currently in transition where they just relaunched after many, many years, they just relaunched the football program. And in their football program, they were having some difficulty. They had partnered with um, some local um, schools, high schools, to to host practices and host games and things like that. And so the partnership that they previously had, it didn't go well over the last year. And so they reached out to us. We have some vacant land that we're not going to be developing on until early um, January of 2022. And so they asked us, they said, well, can we partner, can, can we rent your land for our kids to practice on for the upcoming season. And we will pay for, you know, the improvements, all of these things. And I said, well, in lieu of paying for these things, why don't we just translate this into an academic scholarship for one of our kids? And so they said, yes. And nice. uh, very nice. So we're, we're I mean, and, and, and I was thinking initially, I was thinking maybe, you know, I was thinking, well, it was probably, you know, when you do the math, I was thinking, well, it's probably going to be like a one year. But no, they they actually give us a four year room and board, all expense paid scholarship for one of our kids. So we are super excited about that partnership. And I always tell people, you never know until you ask. So we're excited about that partnership. The other um, activity that we're excited about um, deals specifically with uh, professional development and training internally. One of the things we realized at the onset of us losing a lot of public trust before I got there is that people were really not, um, they were really concerned about our maintenance operations. And then when I got there and and did some assessment, I too um, realized that there were some areas where we could certainly improve. And so we immediately uh, partnered with our um, community college, Midlands Technical College, and they have the ability to do some amazing things. And so um, they have a division of their community college that focuses on apprenticeship. And so we sat down and we worked out a very detailed structured apprenticeship program that is going to change the culture and dynamics of our maintenance operations. And so we have um, our maintenance uh, guys right now are enrolled in an apprenticeship program. It's a two-year apprenticeship program where they will um, receive, it's a combination of on-the-job training and um, also classroom training. And so our guys have been um, enrolled in this program for about six months now. And so we're super excited about it. Um, and, and we certainly are seeing the the benefits and the guys are, are excited about it too, because they had, you know, pe- people want to do a good job. You know, you have a good, good group of, of folk that work um, at Columbia Housing and they just want to have the tools uh, to be able to, to put those things into action and, and do a good job and making sure that we provide the best quality service that we can for our residents. Well, I hope that you win NARO national awards for those because those are national best practices. Make sure that um, you let us all know because I think those are just prime for winning. Oh, thank you. I, I definitely have them on the list to submit when the when the applications <laughs> open in November. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that, you know, it's it's the innovation of the spirit that you are working in with your staff and your community and, you know, your residents. And so, you know, I think that it's just so unique what you're doing here. And just kind of speaking of some of your path and, and 
we mentioned earlier that you were previously in Greenville and you've worked for some other housing authorities. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask for more of your wisdom just beyond Columbia. You know, have you seen you know, differences as you've gone to, you know, other places in the nation, whether it's through trade associations or whether it's from your previous experience. I mean, you know, when have you seen be different regional approaches maybe, or, you know, are there commonalities that you see as you reflect in your own journey? You know, when, when I think about my own journey, you know, I've worked at really small housing authorities and learn God knows a lot because you're responsible to do all kinds of stuff. And then I worked at large housing authorities. And so, but one of the things I was, I was just telling a colleague the other day is that when, when I look at the landscape of um, housing authorities and, and we quantify housing authorities based on the number of public housing units, whether or not they're small to, you know, to large or extra large housing authorities, but the small housing authorities that I work for have been some of the most sophisticated housing authorities who have just had some very unique programs. And I'm just going to talk about it for example. The first housing authority that I work with is Aiken Housing Authority. It's also in South Carolina as well. It's a very small housing authority, 250 public housing units. That housing authority operated the Department of Labor Workforce Investment Grant for the entire county that it sits in, which is Aiken County in South Carolina. And they provided workforce development training for adults, dislocated workers, people who were laid off through their jobs from plant closures and downsizing. They provided employment opportunities for youth. They did retraining for um, people who were looking at, uh, you know, transitioning to another career, um, to, you know, to moms who were, um, who was transitioning back into the workforce after having their children. Um, just some very unique things that I haven't seen many housing authorities. I, in fact, I haven't ran across a housing authority yet that has actually been the grantor for the Department of Labor Workforce Investment Act program. That housing authority also had a CDFI. So we did um, small business loans, working with our um, Department of Commerce, and um, and so we were able to get a lot of small businesses up and running and keeping them operational through partnering with um, the, the, the colleges in the area, through taking them through business training um, and professional development to keep their businesses, you know, running in many years to come. And many of those businesses, is, you know, are still operating to this day. And this has been like, you know, I had worked in Aiken over 15 years but these are just some of the examples of things that I've seen some small housing authorities do where you would think that um, a small housing authority really wouldn't have the capacity to do these types of things. But I think that uh, the misnomers out there is that, um, you know, I, I think as an industry, when, when we take a look at our entire, what people are doing across the board, whether it's small or large housing authorities, we have, some, we have a group of very resilient industry leaders who are putting in the work, who are looking at their respective communities and seeing how they can fit into making sure that their communities are great for everybody. And I think that's the piece, that's the story that sometimes doesn't really get told as often. I I always try to give my brothers and sisters out there who are doing great work, you know, a shout out and uh, certainly want to do more of that. But, um, but I just, you know, I just wanted to add that as, as kind of a landscape thing that I've seen over the years. And I, I still think it, it continues to this day. Well, I completely agree. We have a couple of people here at Quidel who were at housing authorities that were really in that small designation mode, you know, that HUD applies. And, you know, they would go toe to toe with anybody to say, I know every single part of the program because I've done every single part of the program. Mm -hmm. You know, they did not have the luxury of passing the, you know, file down to somebody else down the hall, or they didn't have the luxury of not knowing how to do inspections and rent calculation. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And so that is the beauty of an agency that's in that designation is to, you know, to kind of say, you've got to do everything Mm -hmm. because there's no other entire department that does that. 
and, you know, the coordination and the buck steps with you because you're the person. <laughs> so uh, we have several people at Quidel who say the exact same thing that you just said. But, you know, that's how it, they got into the industry early on is, you know, one in particular um, employee I'm thinking of, he had just gotten out of the military and he couldn't find a job. And he just said, I took any job that came to me and it just happened to be, you know, a housing specialist, a housing <laughs> authority. And he has never left the industry, you know, what was 30 years later. Um, but he says that he wouldn't trade that time, you know, that he started out at that housing agency, basically doing everything from taking the office trash out to inspections to rent calculations. So, um, you know, and now he's speaking on national panels as the industry expert. So, um, I, you know, I like that part of our industry that the numbers of the portfolio do not dictate the strength of the agency or the individuals mm -hmm. or the community that um, is reflected there. You know, just thinking of that journey that I've, of one of our employees that I was just talking about, you know, how did you get started in this industry? You know, what, how did you come into it? You know, when I think about it, it's almost like a purpose driven life, right? I think about the fact that I grew up in rural South Carolina, very humble beginnings. I, I lived in a 1960s mobile home that my daddy, Jimmy, rigged to the umpteenth degree. Like you couldn't have two things running at the same time in the house, you know, <laughs> because the electricity would automatically turn off. He and had he had his method. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he had his method. And so I ended up going to college on an athletic scholarship. And um, when I was in college, I did some internship work at the pardon, parole, and probation's office. And I didn't realize when I was doing the work at the pardon, parole, and probation office, I just didn't realize the correlation of, you know, how that impacts housing, how that impacted, you know, employment opportunities, mm -hmm. so forth and so on. And so um, I got a little bit of um, understanding about, because I had to help some of the um, folk who were going through the probation office, I had to help them with making referrals to housing authorities and, you know, and other types of things that they needed to transition back into, um, you know, the world. And so um, anyway, moving fast forward, I ended up, um, when I graduated from college, I did some community work working for one of our uh, city council women. And I told her at the time, I said, you know, I want to do something that, just makes my heart feel good every single day when I come to work. Like I, I really want, I'm passionate about doing something that makes my heart feel good. And she said, Ivory, we've got a, a new city manager and we have a new housing authority executive director. I know that they're looking for people you might want to apply. Well, I applied. I didn't get the job. I was devastated, right? <laughs> so anyway, I went on and, and, and continued my community organizing work. And the housing authority executive director at that time, he saw my dedication to community organizing work. And he reached out to me and offered me an opportunity to apply for a job. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. So this is my time. So I went and applied. I got the job. And the rest was history. I started out in compliance. I knew absolutely nothing. I had to learn everything from the ground up about housing authority compliance world. And he was a tremendous advocate for putting a lot of resources in professional development and training. And so I, I got a lot of professional development and training, a tremendous amount of on-the-job training. I made some, uh, some, some mistakes. I, I did some good things. But I wouldn't trade it for nothing in the world. And that's how I ended up um, in housing. And I've loved it ever since. It, it is just, it, it, it really fulfills, you know, who I am each day. And I think just by me growing up in, a, in an environment where housing, where I did not have a, a housing, a stable housing situation, you know, I tell people sometimes my first opportunity at living in quality housing was when I went to college and moved in a dorm room. And, and this wasn't a plush dorm room like dorm rooms are today. This was like, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this was the stinky, smelly dorm room that you, you know, how dorm rooms were in the, you know, in the, in the, in the early nineties, but it was how they were yeah. really like. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, thank you for sharing that journey. I, I think that um, there's so many of us who are in this industry. We're practitioners, we're operators, you know, and, and I like to say, yes, we know compliance, but if you don't understand why you're doing it, who you're doing it for, or you don't have the personal experience, you know, from, you know, understanding what housing instability can do, it makes it, you know, really just I kind of shallow to just do compliance. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, you, you really have to know the full story. So thank you for sharing that and trusting us with that, because I know that's probably what drives you and you can really speak the truth to your team. So it comes across with so much um, severity and emphasis. I think that I'm sure that is what is helping you turn the tide there in Columbia and really for the state when you think about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I I do. I, I feel like my story, you know, my journey, when there's opportunity for me to to tell people about it, whether it's one-on-one, you know, or whether it's in a group setting, I always uh, share that piece of information with them because I want them to understand that I too was in this space and that I'm passionate about my work and that if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give it my all and, um, and I'm going to make sure that, that it happens. And so um, each day that I'm able to give one more family the opportunity to live in a quality place to call home is, is something that makes me proud. Well, Irie, it has been a pleasure. And I know our podcast listeners are going to really enjoy hearing about you, learning more about what's driving you and all of the great development activity that is on the horizon for Columbia. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadl.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.